Hi and welcome back to analyzing software using deep learning. This is part three of this introduction and what I want to do here in this um, third part is to talk about some basics of the two fields that this course is combining, namely program analysis and deep learning. I assume that some of you already have some background in at least one of these two um, yeah, fields. So um, this is basically um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page and it may be a little bit of a repetition for some of you, um, but this is just to make sure that we are all ready to get deeper into the material. So let me start with some background on uh, program analysis and in particular on the question of how a program can actually be represented when it's processed by an algorithm or by a computer in general. There's one obvious representation that everybody has uh, of course seen when writing code and that is to represent code as a sequence of characters. Um, it turns out that this is not the best representation and there are many others that people working on program analysis like to use. Uh, including sequences of tokens, abstract syntax trees, uh, control flow graphs, data dependency graphs, call graphs, and many, many others. We will not talk about all of those um, here in this, um, in this uh, video, but uh, just focus on a few which, um, yeah, basically we will visit again and again when talking about different approaches uh, in this course. And these are the four that you can now see here. So let's uh, start right away with the first representation, um, which looks at programs as a sequence of tokens. So what is a token? Um, you can basically think of a token as something like a word in a uh, natural language, but for programming languages. So basically the tokens are the words of your program. The tool that produces these tokens is called a tokenizer, or sometimes also called Alexa. And it typically is part of a compiler because one of the very first things that a compiler is doing is to take your program and uh, cutting it into, into these tokens. Um, every um, token is a subsequence of the characters that are in this file that contains your entire program. And tokenization is basically taking this long sequence of characters and cutting it into um, smaller sequences that then, uh, con well, that then is the sequence of, of tokens. Just to give you an example, so for Java, um, there are six kinds of tokens, which you can see here on the, um, on the slide. So one of them are identifiers, basically all these names that developers can choose for their classes, variables, fields, methods, and so on. Then there are keywords, things like if and while and class, for example. So basically all the built-in um, keywords that in this case, the Java language provides. Another group of tokens are separators. So things like, um, like this dot, which is for example used if you want to access a member of an object and also these uh, curly braces, which are for example used to uh, start and end um, blocks. Then um, another group of tokens are operators. So everything that is used for example for arithmetic operations or for, for other kinds of operations on values such as this multiplication operator or the um, uh, plus plus operator. Then there are literals, which are basically constants that you literally write into your code. Um, for example, numbers like 23 or a string like hi. And again, this is some um, kind of token where developers can create arbitrarily many new tokens. And we'll see in one of the later modules that this is actually quite a bit of a challenge for learning based program analysis. And then finally, the last kind of token, which is often ignored in program analysis, but which we'll also see as something very interesting in a learning based analysis are comments. Um, so natural language information that is somehow associated with parts of your code. So let me give you an example for how this tokenization works for a very simple piece of Java. So let's assume our code is the following. So we have an if statement that is checking if some flag is equal to true. And then if this is the case, the case, then some variable called name is set to Joe and that's already it. So now if the 
tokenizer gets this piece of code, it will um, extract a couple of tokens. So one of them are kino, uh, keyword tokens. So in this example, this if, for example, is a keyword, then there will be some, um, some separator token, in particular this open parentheses here, the closing parentheses, the curly braces that open and close, and also this semicolon that is used to, to end the statement. Then we have a couple of identifiers here. So basically all these names that developers can use, for example, for this variable flag, or also for this other variable uh, called name. And all of those uh, identifier tokens. Then we have some operators here, in particular this double equal and also this assignment operator, the single equals. And now the only thing that um, remains are the literal tokens. So this true, for example, and the string Joe, which basically um, mean they are constants that are literally given um, in the source code. And now based, based on these different categories of tokens, what we'll get is a sequence of tokens that basically consist of these um, colored boxes. And this is one possible way to represent a program. So tokens are basically the most simple form of representing a program because they almost literally show you what is in the source code file, just cut into smaller subsequences of characters. A slightly more involved representation of programs is the abstract syntax tree. So what an abstract syntax tree or short AST is doing is to show you the code in a tree representation that mirrors the structure of the code. It is called abstract because some of the details of this concrete syntax are omitted in this tree. So for example, the curly braces that mark the end and the beginning of a block in Java are not represented in an abstract syntax tree, but instead you'll basically have a subtree that represents the entire block. The nodes in an AST um, correspond to constructs in your source code, um, and then the edges in this tree um, represent parent-child relationships, basically telling you that one source code construct is a part of another source code construct. If you want to get a concrete idea of how such ASTs look like, I can recommend this uh, demo of Esprima, which is one tool to give you an AST for the JavaScript language. Um, it has a very nice web interface where you basically insert um, a little bit of JavaScript code and then you see right next to it the AST for this piece of code and then you can play with the tree, play with the code and, and ch see how one changes um, if you change the other. Let me also show you an example um, here in the video. So this will be um, an example of an abstract syntax tree. And in this example, um, we'll use a little piece of JavaScript code. So this code is very simple. It's basically one statement that says, hey, there's a variable x, and I want to assign to this variable the result of multiplying six with whatever is in variable y. Now, if you take this little piece of code and uh, pass it into an abstract syntax tree, then what you'll get is a tree that looks as follows. So at the root of the tree, we'll have a node called program. And it turns out for every abstract syntax tree of every piece of JavaScript code, the root is called program. Then you have an edge that um, goes to this statement that we see in the source code. And this happens to be um, a variable declaration. Each of these edges um, has some names. So in this case, this is marked as the body of the program. And now in this body, we have um, another child node, which in this case is a variable uh, declarator. Which is um, part of the list of declarations that this variable declaration 
um, has. The reason why um, there, there are two nodes is because you could have multiple declarations in a variable declaration. For example, you could in the same statement also assign some value to another variable A. Now every variable uh, declarator consists of two parts. One is the uh, left-hand side of the assignment or the left-hand side of the of the declaration which here is represented through an identifier node and then the right-hand side which um, shows us what expression this identifier is initialized with and in this case this happens to be a binary expression because we have this binary operation of multiplication that gives us the result um, of this expression. So what we see on the on the left is the ID and what we see on the right is um, the thing that initializes this, this ID. And now we need to um, add a few more nodes to this to this AST. So this identifier happens to have a name and this name happens to be X. And for the binary expression, um, we see that there is um, well, it consists of three things. One of them is the operator of this expression. Then we have whatever's on the left of this expression. And then we have the right hand side of this expression. The operator in this case is this multiplication operator. The left hand side in this case is a literal and the right hand side is an identifier. And now each of those also need to be made more um, specific. So the literal will have a value and then the, end, then the identifier will have a name. And in this concrete example, the value of the literal happens to be six and the name of this identifier here on the, on the right happens to be Y. And this is the entire abstract syntax tree for this little piece of JavaScript code. So the abstract syntax tree focuses mostly on the structure of the code. It abstracts away some of the concrete syntax that um, is not really relevant to reason about the code. But what it does not show you is in what order the statements in the code are actually executed. Because the order in which statements appear in the code may not be the order in which they are executed. If you do care about the flow of control, so the order uh, in which things in your program happen, then the right representation is a control flow graph, which models the flow of control through a program. A control flow graph, again, is a graph, so it has nodes and edges. And specifically here, the nodes represent so-called basic blocks, which are essentially sequences of operations that, were all, that are always executed together. And then the edges between these uh, basic blocks represent possible transfers of control, basically saying that this one block may be followed by this other block. Typically, control flow graph, um, or CFG, as it's usually abbreviated, is built on the method level. So for one method, we'll have one graph that shows us all the operations that happen in this method and in what order they may happen. So let me also show you an example of such a control flow graph. And here again, I'll use um, a simple piece of JavaScript code to, to show this idea. So in this piece of code, let's say we have an if, which checks some condition. And then if this condition is true, we'll be executing the statement x equals five. And else we'll be executing the statement x equals seven. And then this whole if statement is followed by a call to console log which prints the value of x to the console. Now, if we create a control flow graph for this piece of code, it will have four nodes. One of them is this uh, evaluation of the if condition, basically checking whether C evaluates to true or false. This um, check of the condition may be followed by two things. It may either be followed by the statement x um, gets assigned five, or by this other statement where x is assigned seven. So we'll have two edges, one going to each of these two nodes. 
And then at the end, no matter which of these two statements we execute, at the end we'll come back to this um, console log statement where we are writing x to the console. So this is another um, node in our control flow graph. And because this can be executed after this one assignment or after the other, we'll have two more edges in, in our node, uh, sorry, in our graph. Um, things can get a little bit more complicated if we have a program with loops, in which case we'll basically have an edge that goes back to one of the um, nodes that we have already been at, which means this graph can actually have cycles and it doesn't have to be um, an acyclic graph as in this simple example. The final kind of program representation that I would like to briefly introduce here is a data dependency graph. So in contrast to a control flow graph, which looks at the order in which statements or operations in a program are executed, a data dependency graph models the flow of data from one operation to another. And specifically, it models the flow of data from an operation called a definition, which is basically every place where you are writing some data, to an operation called a use, which is basically every place where you're reading some data. Again, um, a data dependency graph consists of nodes and edges. The nodes in this case are all the operations in your program that either define or use, or maybe both, um, some data. And the edges um, represent the possible definition use relationships between these operations. So they basically show us that the data that is uh, defined at some operation may be used at some other operation. So if you have an edge from node n1 to node n2, then this means that n2 may read some data that is written at operation n1. Let me also show you a little example here. So this is going to be an example for a data dependency graph. And again, I'm going to use JavaScript syntax, even though the syntax or the specific language doesn't really matter. You could do this with any other language you'd like. Um, so in this case, we have two variables x and y that are assigned three and five, followed by an if statement where we check whether x is greater or equal to one. If this is the case, we are assigning the value of x to y. And then we have a third variable after the if statement where we assign the sum of x and y to variable z. Now let's have a look at the data dependency graph here. So we would have a node for every operation or every statement that uh, either reads or writes some data, so that either um, defines or uses some data. In this case, we would have one node for this oops, assignment of x um, that assigns value of 3. Now the question is, where can this uh, value be used that is defined here? So one um, operation that uses this value is when evaluating the condition of this if, where we check whether x is greater or equal to 1. And because this can use this value defined above, um, we'll have an edge like this. Another place where this may be used is in the body of the if statement, where we are assigning x to y because this is also reading the value of x so there's another edge here and then it may also be used at this uh, last statement where x plus y is written into z because also this statement may use the value that is defined um, in the first line and then we still need to show where the value of y is defined so there's another node here which corresponds to this assignment of 5 to y. And this may be used here at this statement at the end because this is actually reading y and the place where this may be defined in addition to this other definition that we have here is, um, is this uh, assignment of y um, with the value 5. All right, so this was a very, very brief uh, introduction of some of the concepts um, that are relevant here for program analysis. We will introduce some more of these, um, of course, throughout the course, but this should be um, enough for this introduction. And we can now look into some of the basics of deep learning. 
Uh, let me use as an example um, a task that has become kind of a classic in deep learning, namely handwriting recognition. So the goal is to recognize digits between 0 and uh, 9 um, from the handwriting that is given as an image. This is a relatively easy task for humans. So for example, if I show you this sequence of digits, digits that you see here on the slides, um, you can probably figure out what uh, digits these are, but it turns out to be a pretty challenging task, or at least has been a pretty challenging task for a computer. Um, so now the idea to um, solve this task using deep learning is to learn from a large number of training examples where we basically have an image along with a label that tells us what digit this image represents. And using this data, we can then train a model that at the end becomes pretty good at predicting the digits that are shown uh, on images. And if you use a deep learning model for this purpose, then typically you'll get more than 99% accuracy um, with, with modern models. Um, nowadays. So how does this work? So how can um, a deep learning model predict what digit um, is represented on an image? The way this works is by having a network of so-called neurons. And what I want to do now is to just give you a very simple example of such a network. So in this example, I'll use these little circles to represent the individual neurons. And in this example, we would have multiple layers of, of neurons. And the very first layer that you see here at the beginning is what is called the input layer. As the name suggests, what the input layer does is to represent the input that we want to give to our model. So for our example of handwriting recognition, this could basically be a representation of the pixels of an image. Now, in addition to the neurons in this input layer, um, we will have more layers. So in this example, let's say we have one more layer that looks like this. And now all the neurons, or at least some of the neurons in our uh, network are connected with each other. And in this example, we'll connect all the neurons from the input layer to all the neurons in this first layer. So this basically looks like this. So the information from the first neuron in the input layer can flow to all the three neurons that we have in this first uh, so-called hidden layer. And the same for all the other um, input neurons. So they all can go to all the neurons in the hidden layer. All right, now in addition to this one hidden layer, there may be another hidden layer, which in this example um, has again three neurons. And again, everything is connected with everything. So the, all the neurons from the first hidden layer are connected with all the neurons from the second hidden layer. So it looks like that. And then at some point, we'll also have an output layer, which in this very, very simple example consists of just one single neuron and this output layer is connected um, with all the neurons from the last hidden layer. So we have these three connections that all go to the output layer. So let me add some terminology to this uh, little picture here. So these layers in the middle are the so-called hidden layers. And this layer here at the end, which in this simple example consists of just a single neuron, is the output layer. And this whole thing is the network or the neural network. Um, just to make this picture complete, so basically all of these things here are our neurons. And for the example of um, recognizing uh, digits, what this output layer could, for example, represent is whether or not the digit that is shown on the uh, image whose pixels we get as an input is, say, the digit 3.
So you can think of this basically as, um, as a probability that the model predicts, telling us how likely it is that the pixels actually represent the digit three. In practice, the networks that recognize um, digits on images are a bit more complex. And in practice, they also um, have um, more than just one neuron as an output. But for our simple example, um, this is good enough. So now these neurons um, basically look like these little circles. Let's now have a um, slightly more detailed look at, at what they actually are. And let's start with one of the most simple neurons that exist and which are actually not used in today's deep learning models, but still are very interesting to understand the basic ideas. Um, and these simple models are what is called a perceptron. Um, so perceptrons are the most basic kind of neural um, of neurons and the reason why they are so basic is because they can only take binary inputs so basically every input is either zero or one and also produce only binary outputs so also the output is is, is just zero or one so let me just show you a little example. Um, so we could have our neuron here and it gets as its input, let's say three values, x1, x2, and x3. And then it's supposed to produce some output. And now the question is, how does it know what the output is depending on the input? And this is where it becomes interesting because this, because the output is controlled by two things. One, are so-called weights, which basically give every input a specific weight and tell us how important this input is for the output. So we'll have three of those, w1, 2, and 3. And then there's also um, a so-called bias, which can basically um, change the output irrespective um, of the input. And now given these weights and biases, we can compute the output as follows. We can say that the output is either zero or one. And now the question is when is what used? So here we say that the output is zero if the sum over all our inputs, which I'm indexing here with J, where we multiply every input with the corresponding weight is smaller or equal to some threshold. And we say that the output is one um, in the other case, which basically means if all the inputs weighted by their weight w um, and then summed up are larger than some threshold. And um, a shorter way to write the same thing, and this is the way that is, that is typically used um, in deep learning papers and also in some of the, um, or basically all of the courses that um, ahead of us is that we say it's zero if the weights times the input plus the bias is smaller or equal to zero and it's one if the weights times the input plus the bias is larger than zero. All right, now just to complete this little notes the W here stands for the for the weights and the B here stands for the biases that each of these neurons and in particular these perceptrons have. So let me illustrate this idea with a little example. And in this example, um, we want to predict whether you should go to a cheese festival that is happening in your city. So it's very, very important question and let's assume that in order to make this decision whether you go to the cheese festival um, there are three factors that you take in, into consideration so one of them is whether the weather is good because you're more likely to actually go to the festival if the weather is good the second factor that is important for you is whether your friends are going because you don't want to go there alone and then the third factor, which seems obvious, is that um, it's the question whether you actually like cheese or not. And now using these three um, 
um, inputs, you want to make a decision, which is whether you go to the cheese festival. And now the way you do this is obviously through um, a neuron, which we have here in the middle. The neuron gets these three inputs and is supposed to produce the output. And now in order to make this decision, the neuron requires its weights and biases. And in this example, let's assume that the weight for the first input is five, the weight for the second input is three, and the weight for the third input is one. And let's say our bias here is minus seven. And now to make this concrete, let's assume we have um, some specific inputs given because for a specific day um, and for a specific cheese festival, you're given um, the weather and whether your friends go and whether you actually do like cheese. In this case, um, let's say the first input is, is one, the second input is also one. So you, the weather is good, your friends are going, but you do not like cheese. And now in order to fully understand what's going on, I invite you to just pause the video for a second and do the computation yourself so that you really understand what's going on. Um, but I'll of course give you also the answer here. So what um, we'll do is we will multiply the input with the weights, which in this case means we will multiply five times one. So the first input times the first weight plus three times one for the second input and then zero times one for the third input. And this um, sums up to eight. And now using this and the bias, we can now determine the output. And basically we'll see that it would be um, zero if eight, so our result of W times X minus the, or plus the bias, so in this case minus seven, um, would be smaller or equal to zero. And um, it would be one if eight minus seven is larger than zero. In this case, um, the output is uh, one, which is larger than zero. And this essentially means we will, or you will go to the festival. Now computing whether you go to a cheese festival is of course very important, but the cool thing is that you can use these perceptrons um, for, for other computations. And one of them, and that's the perhaps most important one here, is that you can use them to compute logical functions. So let me show you how to do this. And let me use one particular logical function which you've probably already seen in some other kind of course, namely NAND gates or not AND gates. So what we want to have here is a gate that returns one whenever not both of the inputs are true. So essentially what we would like to have is something that looks like this. We have these two inputs, x1 and x2, and they can be zero and zero or zero and one or one and zero, or one and one. And we want the output to be one if and only if not both of the inputs um, are one. Okay, and now the question is, how can we do this using just a single perceptron? And the magic is that we can actually do it by basically feeding these two inputs, x1 and x0, into the perceptron and then getting our output. And by having weights and biases that and bias that makes sure that the output is exactly what we want to have. And in this case, this for example works if we set w1, so the first weight, to minus two, w2 um, also to minus two, and the bias to three. And you can now convince yourself that this actually works. Let me just show you for one example. So the um, output for zero and zero uh, is one, because in this case we will get zero times um, minus two, which is zero, 
plus um, zero times minus two again, which again is zero, and then um, plus three because this is the bias and because this is larger than zero, um, this gives us the output uh, one. So why do we even care about NAND gates? Well, the reason is something you might remember from some other course of computer science that you may have heard at some point. It is that by just using NAND gates, we can express arbitrary computations. And by extension, um, if we have a model built from a perceptron that can um, express what a NAND gate is doing, then by having multiple of these NAND perceptrons, we can express arbitrary computations using just a neural network. Um, let me illustrate this using an example. Um, so here we have a combination of NAND gates that is adding two bits. I'm not going to go through all the details of it, so you can convince yourself that this is actually adding two bits. And then at, at the bottom you see the corresponding network of perceptrons that is doing essentially the same thing. So it's also adding two bits and you can basically express this computation just using the perceptrons that we've just seen. So now you know that by combining different um, neurons, we can basically express arbitrary computations and you can just build complex networks out of these neurons that perform arbitrarily complex algorithms. Now the big question is, how do we decide the weights and biases of these complex networks? So just for the NAND gates, we could do it by hand. You can basically play with the weights and biases until you see that this is actually a NAND. But for a more complex network, this is not really what you want to do. So hand tuning these networks is infeasible uh, as, as soon as you have a slightly more complex network. Instead, the key idea behind machine learning with neural networks is to automatically, automatically learn these um, weights and biases. And this enables deep learning to actually learn to express these complex computations. So let's have a look how this learning works and whether the perceptrons that we've just looked at are a good candidate for neurons to help with this learning. So what we want to do here is making learning possible. So as a simple example, let's assume we have a neural network that consists of um, some input layer, a hidden layer with three neurons, and then some output. And let's again assume we have all the neurons of one layer connected to all the neurons of the next layer. So what we'll get is essentially this. And now for some given input, um, we will get some output based on the current weights that we have at all these uh, connections. So I'm only showing you one of these weights here. And let's say this uh, weight then helps us to get this output. Now, if the output is not what we want, we need to help the model to get better, which basically works by telling the model that we would like to have a slightly different output, which we get by adding some delta output here to the output that we currently get. And then we use some math, which we'll not get into exactly here in this course, um, which will help us to um, determine that we need to adapt the weight accordingly in order to get the output that we want. And in order to enable this kind of learning, we need to have an important property, which is that a small change of the uh, weights and biases in our network So such a small change of the weights and biases should cause a small change of the output. Now, if you look at the perceptrons that we have seen so far, then you'll see that this is actually not the right kind of neuron to provide this property.
Why is that? Well, the reason is that the output of the perception basically follows a step function, which means that it suddenly changes instead of changing a little bit if you change the weights, uh, weights and biases um, a little bit. So this step function basically looks like this, that um, it produces outputs between zero and one. And now up to some point, this output um, is zero. And then suddenly at some point, this output um, becomes one. And this is not really what we want because it makes it very difficult to learn anything because we do not have this nice property that changing the weights and biases a little bit also changes the output by a little bit. Fortunately, there is another kind of neuron that we can replace our perceptrons with and then we suddenly get this property that we want. And this kind of neuron is called a sigmoid neuron. So the neuron looks basically the same as before. So it's one of these little circles and it gets some inputs and outputs. Let's say x1, x2 and x3 which is then used to produce an output. And again, there are some um, weights and biases here. So again, for every input, we have some weight W and then we have this bias B. But what is different now um, compared to the perception is that all these inputs and also the output can take arbitrary values. So this, this, and also this, just as this, can take arbitrary values and specifically arbitrary values in the range of zero and one. So how does this sigmoid neuron now compute the output given the input? Um, it again works by multiplying each of the inputs with, its, with the corresponding weight and then adding the bias. But now instead of applying this step function to it as we implicitly did for the perception, we now use this so-called sigmoid function represented by this little sigma. And the cool thing about this sigmoid function is that it does not have this sharp step from um, one value to the other, but instead it looks, um, it has an S-like sh uh, -like shape and it basically is a continuous function that does not suddenly jump to some other value. So let me um, try to draw this here. I'm not really good at drawing um, functions like this, but I hope you get the idea. So it basically starts um, at zero, then at some point increases and eventually approaches one. Mathematically, this is um, defined as, as follows. So this little sigma stands for the sigmoid function. And it's defined such that it takes some value, let's say z, and returns one divided by one plus e to the power of minus z. And in our case, this means it's one divided by one plus, and then e to the power of the negative sum over all our weights, where we are um, summing up over j times the corresponding input and then this whole thing plus our bias b. And now the cool thing is that this kind of neuron enables learning. Because a small change of uh, one of the weights or the bias will cause a small change in the output. So now you've seen two of these functions, um, the step function and the sigmoid function. And the more general concept behind all of this is that these are called activation functions. So one of them um, 
you've already seen. It's this step function that roughly looks like this. So it's zero and then at some point jumps to one and then is one. Then the other one that you have already seen is the sigmoid function or sometimes also called logistic function. which as you've already seen roughly looks like that. It's this S shape. So it starts at zero. Uh, let me try again. Starts here, slowly goes up and then approaches one. Um, another kind of function that you could use as an activation function is the identity function, which simply returns the same value as um, the value that is given to it. So this essentially looks like this, that if a negative value is given, it returns negative. If zero is given, it returns zero. And if a positive value is given, it returns this very same positive value. And yet another kind of activation function, which you'll uh, probably um, encounter every now, and then, every now and then is the rectified linear unit. which um, is called like this because it, similar to the identity function, um, returns the same thing as the input, but not for negative values, because for negative value, it simply returns uh, zero. And now what is important to know is that these different activation functions are useful in different kinds of networks and in, at different places in these neural networks. And when exactly to use what um, will uh, go beyond this course, we'll cover some of these activation functions in, um, in different um, modules of this course, but we won't really go into the details of when exactly to use which of those. All right, so now you've seen that these neural networks are composed of neurons and you have an idea of how the neuron computes its output based on the input, the weights and the biases. Now, earlier we hinted at the idea that these weights and biases are adapted automatically in order to make a network compute what we actually wanted to compute. And now the big question is, how does that work? One important factor that we we'll look at now is that there needs to be some kind of feedback that tells the network how good the current output is so that it gets an idea in, in what direction to change in order to become even better. And this kind of feedback uh, feedback is what is called a cost function. So let's have a look at these cost functions, which enable learning because they provide uh, feedback to the model. So what this cost function does is to provide feedback. on how good the output is for a given input. So let me um, illustrate this with a simple example. And this example again is motivated by this idea of recognizing handwriting and in, in particular digits. So let's assume we have some kind of network, which um, we do not have to worry about in detail. And let's assume that this network predicts the probability that the digit that it gets as an input is zero. And it has another output, which is interpreted as the probability that a digit is one and so on down to nine. So basically for every digit, there's a probability that tells us how likely it is that this is um, the digit that is shown on the given image. So for example, let's assume that we provide an image where we know that it is showing the digit six. So it is known that this di digit is six. Then what we want the output to be is the following. So the output will be 
represented as a vector of, of 10 digits. And for the first few digits, which are not six, we want the output to be uh, zero. So for digit zero, we want to say that the probability is zero. The same for one and two and three and four and five. But then for digit six, we want the model ideally to present one as the probability because it should be very certain that the digit shown on the image is six. And then for the remaining three digits, again, it is going to be zero. Now, the problem is that the network won't be perfect. So the actual output that it provides may be something else. For example, the actual output, um, let's call it A, could be the following. So maybe it's pretty certain that this is not a zero, pretty certain that this is not a one, and pretty certain that this is not a two. But it isn't so sure about three, so it gives 20% probability that this might be a three. It's sure that it's not a four. It's sure that it's not a five. And it has a relatively high um, probability assigned two digit six, so it is on the right track. But it also assumes that it might be an eight, uh, sorry, a seven. Um, whereas for eight and nine, it's again certain that this is not the right digit. Okay, so we get a vector that looks a little bit like the one we want to get, but it's not yet quite there. So now to communicate to the model that this actual output is not quite what we want, we need to provide as feedback um, a cost imposed by having this wrong output. And one way to do this, um, and this is one out of many different cost functions that we could use here, is the so-called quadratic cost function. So what it does is to take the desired output that we would like to see and then computes um, the distance from this um, output to the actual output that we get and specifically looks at the length of this vector. If you imagine this, um, these two points as two points in a vector space, we look at the length between these two points and then um, squares this distance. So this is called the quadratic cost function. And usually this is not only done for one specific input example, but actually over a set of input examples, for example, all the examples in our training data. And then we take the average um, over all of these costs or the average over all of these errors. So this should be an N and what the N um, refers to is the number of training inputs that we have. So this is called um, the cost function. And because we are actually taking the, the, um, this error squared and then take the average, this is also called the mean squared error. Okay, so as a little quiz to make sure that you fully understand this idea of a cost function and in particular of this mean squared error cost function, um, let's have a little example. And again, um, use the example of recognizing handwritten digits, but now only looking at the digits 0, 1, and 2. The basic idea is the same. It's just um, that we have slightly shorter vectors here than if we would have to deal with all 10 digits. Now let's assume that we um, have two training examples, example one and example two. And for each of these training examples, we get an actual value that our model is currently predicting, um, this and this. And we also have the desired um, output that we would like to get um, from our model. Now, given these um, four vectors, um, the question for you is what is the value of this cost function um, that would be computed if you now would uh, compute the cost of these current predictions that the model is giving us. So now I invite you to pause the video at this point and actually do the computation um, using pen and paper so that you get a good feeling for what this cost function really means. All right, so let me show you the solution. So the cost function will return the average, um, so one divided by n, 
and here we have the sum over all our inputs x and for each of these inputs we take the value that we would like to see the desired output minus the value that we currently get and then we square all these all these differences so in our case we have two examples so it's one divided by two times and now here we have this sum where um, it's useful to know what exactly this um, computation of the length of the vector means so let me just repeat this um, in case anyone has forgotten so if we have a vector um, x y z then the length of this vector can be computed as um, x square plus y square plus z square and for our concrete example this means that here we'll have um, to compute the length of this vector which is zero minus 0 0.5 0 0.5 and 0 plus um, this other vector which only consists of zeros and now if you do the math um, you'll see that this is 0 0.5 plus zero and this whole thing divided by two means we have 0 0.25 as our cost. So now that we know how to compute the cost function, let's have a look at how the learning actually works. Um, so now the goal of learning is to minimize the cost function. So we want to find weights and biases that across all the examples we train the model with minimizes the cost function so that ideally it would be zero. The way deep learning typically does this minimization is using a technique called gradient descent. We will not go into the details of the math underlying gradient descent, but intuitively the idea is that we compute a gradient of the cost function um, so that we see how we need to um, adapt the weights and biases in order to reduce this cost function. So um, as visualized on this little graphic here, we basically try to move closer and closer toward um, um, the minimum in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. And actually how large these steps are is determined by the so-called learning rate, which is one of the hyperparameters that you can typically set when you configure the learning process of one of these deep learning models. Now the effort of doing this uh, gradient uh, computation depends on how many training examples you have. Ideally, you would like to optimize the model perfectly for all the training examples that you have, but in practice, this can be pretty expensive. So instead, what is used most of the time is a, a process called stochastic gradient descent, which takes a small subset of all the examples that you have and then computes an estimate of the true gradient and then adapts the weights and biases based on this estimate of the true gradient. In order to find this sample, what is usually done is um, that we split all the training data that we have into k so-called mini batches, basically subsets of the, um, of the training data, and then train the network with one of these subsets or mini batches after the other until we have seen all the data in our training set. And this going through all the data once, always in batches of um, of, of samples that we use for stochastic gradient descent. This is called one epoch. So basically going once through the data is what is called an epoch. All right, and this is all I want to say about uh, program analysis and deep learning at this point. So I hope you now have at least a little bit of an idea of how these two um, fields work. And of course, um, we look more into this in the upcoming modules. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.